Welcome to the Research and Housing. Today we are going to be reading a story. But first up, we are going to be reading the Bible. Then we are going to be doing the synopsis with me today. So let's see how that goes. Um, then, after we do the synopsis, we are going to be doing Fellowship of the Ring. Lord of the Rings. I hope you guys enjoy. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell not miss another video. And here is my dad with Bible time. Good evening. We are... So I just looked at Luke chapter 22, which is our Bible verse passage for this evening, and it's 71 verses. So, let's see how we do. This is the English Standard Version, Luke chapter 22, and hello, Rebecca. I'm assuming that's what the other person is, but I don't know, because I don't see anything. All right, so Luke chapter 22, English Standard Version, here we go. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. Then they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, you, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he, has, he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute arose or also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest, become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel." Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, and your faith may not fall, and that, that your faith may not fall. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers." 
Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment." And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the, hour and the power of darkness." Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say, what I, or, you say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. And that, even though it is in the middle of the scene, is where we will stop for today and we will continue that scene tomorrow, beginning with Jesus before Pontius Pilate. So, I will try to do what I can about a synopsis here. Um, basically... Frodo was talking to Gandalf. Gandalf told him about the ring. He told him about Smeagol. 
and how Smeagol is actually or is became Gollum and blah 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 and then uh, they noticed that the shears weren't chopping anymore and Gandalf reached out and pulled Sam into the room and said oh you've been spying and he's like I've not been spying on no Eve sir actually I, I kind of like the the phrasing that they used in the movie better and I can't remember exactly how it is no Eve, I hadn't been dropping no Eve I sir yeah <laughs> yeah so um, yeah, I, I definitely like the phrase that they use in the movie better, but sometimes, as we learned with The Princess Bride, they have a little bit extra time to tweak some of the verbiage when they're making a movie um, that they don't necessarily have with the book, and this book being like 150,000 words just from book one of this story. Um, that's a lot of words to tweak, so I, you know, I'll give J.R.R. Tolkien the pass on that one. But I do think that, that whoever wrote the screenplay, whether it's Peter Jackson or whatever, did a good job with that. I just don't think he did as good a job with the Hobbit screenplay. But there we go. All right, so we are going to read about half again of chapter two. Three is, sorry, chapter three. Three is company. So this is book one of Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, book one, chapter three. Three is company. You ought to go quietly, and you ought to go soon, said Gandalf. Two or three weeks had passed, and still Frodo made no sign of getting ready to go. Here's something else that I notice in the book. I'm sorry to stop and give you commentary. But whenever they make movies, things have to just progress and happen and happen quickly. And they add the, the 60 years because... That's uh, prudent to the story so that Bilbo can be 111 for his birthday party. But then after that, it's like, bam, it could have happened a week later, right? But this is several years after the 60 years passed. And then it takes him a couple of weeks to even get going after he's been sent on the quest. So that's my little tiny commentary for this episode. I promise I'll try to be quiet after that. Um... I'll go ahead and start the chapter over, since we're only one line into okay. it. Chapter 3, 3 is company. You ought to go quietly, and you ought to go soon, said Gandalf. Two or three weeks had passed, and still Frodo made no sign of getting ready to go. I know, but it is difficult to do both, he objected. If I just vanish like Bilbo, the tale will be all over the Shire in no time. Of course you mustn't vanish, said Gandalf. That wouldn't do at all. I said soon, not instantly. If you can think of any way of slipping out of the Shire without its being generally known, it will be worth a little delay, but you must not delay too long. What about the autumn, on or after our birthday? asked Frodo. I think I could probably make some arrangements by then. To tell the truth, he was very reluctant to start. Now that it, it had come to the point, Bag End seemed a more desirable residence than it had for years, and he wanted to savor as much as he could of his last summer in the Shire. When autumn came, he knew that part at least of his heart would think more kindly of journeying, as he always did at that season. He had indeed privately made up his mind to leave on his 50th birthday, Bilbo's 128th. It seemed somehow the proper day on which to set out and follow him. Following Bilbo was uppermost in his mind, and the one thing that made the thought of leaving bearable. He thought as little as possible about the ring and where it might lead him in the end, it, but he did not tell all his thoughts to Gandalf. What the wizard guessed was always difficult to tell. He looked at Frodo and smiled. Very well, he said. I think that will do, but it must not be any later. I am getting very anxious. In the meanwhile, do take care and don't let out, of, don't let out any hint of where you are going. And see that Sam Gamgee does not talk. If he does, I really shall turn him into a toad. As for where I... As for where I am going, said Frodo, it would be difficult to give that away, for I have no clear idea myself yet. Don't be absurd, said Gandalf. I am not warning you against leaving an address at the post office, but you are leaving the Shire, and that should not be known until you are...
You are far away, and you must go or at least set out either north, south, east, or west. And the direction should certainly not be known. I... I have so taken up with the thought of leaving Bag End and of saying farewell that I have never even considered the direction, said Frodo, for where am I to go, and by what shall I steer? What is to be my quest? Bilbo went to find treasure there and back again, but I go to lose one and not to return as far as I can see. But you cannot see very far, said Gandalf. Neither can I. It may be your task to find the cracks of doom, but that quest may be for others I do not know. At any rate, you are not ready for that long road yet. No, indeed, said Frodo. But in the meantime, what course am I to take? Toward danger. But not too rashly, nor too straight, answered the wizard. If you want my advice, make for Rivendell. That journey should not prove too perilous, though the road is less easy than it was, and it will grow worse as the year fails. Rivendell, said Frodo. Very good. I will go east, and I will make for Rivendell. I will take Sam to visit the elves. He will be delighted. He spoke lightly, but his heart was moved suddenly with a desire to see the house of Elrond, half-elven, and breathe the air of that deep valley where many of the fair folk still dwelt in peace. One summer's evening, an astonishing piece of news reached the ivy bush and green dragon. Giants and other portents on the borders of the Shire were forgotten for more important matters. Mr. Frodo was selling Bag End. Indeed, he had already sold it to the Sackville Bagginses. For a nice bit, too, said some. At a bargain price, said others. And that's more likely when Mistress Lobelia is the buyer. Otha had died some years before at the ripe but disappointed age of 102. Just why Mr. Frodo was selling the, his beautiful hole was even more debatable than the price. A few held the theory, supported by the nods and hints of Mr. Baggins himself, that Frodo's money was running out. He was going to leave Hobbiton and live in a quiet way on the proceeds of the sale down in Buckland among his Brandybuck relations. As far from the Sackville Bagginses as may be, some added, but so firmly fixed had the notion in the immeasurable wealth of the Bagginses of Bag End become that most found this hard to believe, harder than any other reason or unreason than their fancy could suggest. To most it suggested a dark and yet unrevealed plot by Gandalf. Though he kept himself very quiet and did not go about by day, it was well known that he was hiding up in the bag end. But however, a removal might fit in with the designs of his wizardry. There was no doubt about the fact Frodo Baggins was going back to Buckland. Yes, I shall be moving this autumn, he said. Mary Brandybuck is looking out for a nice little hole for me, or perhaps a small house. As a matter of fact, with Mary's help, he had already chosen and bought a little house at Crick Hollow in the country beyond Buck Buckleberry. To all but Sam, he pretended he was going to settle down there permanently. The decision to set out eastwards and suggest it had suggested the idea to him, for Buckland was on the eastern borders of the Shire, and he had lived there in childhood, his going back would at least seem credible. Gandalf stayed in the Shire for over two months. Then one evening at the end of June, soon after Frodo's plan had been finally arranged, he suddenly announced that he was going off again next morning. Only for a short while, I hope, he said, but I am going down beyond the southern borders to get some news if I can. I have been idle longer than I should. He spoke lightly, but it seemed to Frodo that he looked rather worried. Has anything happened? he asked. Well, no, but I have heard something that has made me anxious and needs looking into. If I think it necessary, after all, for you to get off at once, I shall come back immediately, or at least send word. In the meanwhile, stick, up, stick to your plan, but be more careful than ever, especially of the ring. Let me impress on you once more. Don't use it. 
He went off at dawn. I may be back any day, he said. At the very latest, I shall come back for the farewell party. I think, after all, you may need my company on the road. At first, Frodo was a good deal disturbed, and wondered, of, wondered often what Gandalf could have heard, but his uneasiness wore off, and in the fine weather he forgot his troubles for a while. The Shire had seldom seemed seen so fair a summer or so rich an autumn the trees were laden with apples honey was dripping in the combs and the corn was tall and full autumn was well under way before frodo began to worry about gandalf again september was passing and there was still no news of him the birthday and the removal drew nearer and still he did not come or send word Bag End began to be busy. Some of Frodo's friends came to stay and help him with the packing. There was Fredegar Bulger and Folko Boffin, and of course his special friends Pippin Took and Mary Brandybook. Between them, they turned the whole place upside down. On September 20th, two covered carts went off laden to Buckland, conveying the furniture and goods that Frodo had not sold to his new home by the way of Brandywine Bridge. The next day, Frodo became really anxious and kept a constant lookout for Gandalf, Thursday, his birthday morning dawned as fair and clear as it had long ago for Bilbo's great party. Still, Gandalf did not appear. In the evening, Frodo gave his farewell feast. It was quite small, just a dinner for himself and his four helpers, but he was troubled and felt in no mood for it. The thought that he would so soon have to part with his young friends weighed on his heart. He wondered how he would break it to them. The four younger hobbits were, however, in high spirits, and the party soon became very cheerful in spite of Gandalf's absence. The dining room was bare except for a table and chairs, but the food was good, and there was good wine. Frodo's wine had not been included in the sale of the, back, the Sackville Bagginses. Whatever happens to the rest of my stuff, when the S.B.s get their claws on it, at any rate, I have found a good home for this, said Frodo as he drained his glass. It was the last drop of the old vineyards. When they had sung many songs and talked of many things they had done together, they toasted Bilbo's birthday and they drank his health and Frodo's together according to Frodo's custom. Then they went out for a sniff of air and glimpse of the stars and then they went to bed. Frodo's party was over and Gandalf had not come. The next morning they were busy packing another cart with the remainder of the luggage. Mary took charge of this and drove off with Fatty, that is, Fredegar Bulger. Someone must get there and warm the house before you arrive, said Mary. Well, see you later, and the day after tomorrow, if you don't go to sleep on the way. Fulco went home after lunch, but Pippin remained behind. Frodo was restless and anxious, listening in vain for a sound of Gandalf. He decided to wait until nightfall. After that, if Gandalf wanted him urgently, he would go to Crick Hollow and might even get there first, for Frodo was going on foot. His plan, for pleasure and a last look at the Shire, as much as any other reason, was to walk from Hobbiton to Buckleberry Ferry, taking it fairly easy. I shall get myself a bit into training, too, he said, looking at himself in a dusty mirror in the half-empty hall. He had not done any strenuous walking for a long time, and the reflection looked rather flabby, he thought. After lunch, the Sackville Bagginses, Lobelia, and her sandy-haired son, Lotho, turned up much to Frodo's annoyance. "'Ours at last,' said Lobelia, as she stepped inside. It was not polite nor strictly true, for the sale of Bag End did not take effect until midnight, but Lobelia can perhaps be forgiven. She had been obliged to wait about seventy-seven years longer for Bag End than she once hoped, and she was now a hundred years old. Anyway, she had come to see that nothing she had paid for had been carried off, and she wanted the keys. It took a long while to satisfy her as she had been brought a complete inventory with her or she had brought a complete inventory with her and went right through it in the end she departed with lotho and the spare key and the promise that the other key would be left 
at the Ganges in Bagshot Row. She snorted and showed plainly that she thought the Ganges capable of plundering the hole during the night. Frodo did not offer her any tea. He took his own tea with Pippin and Sam Gamgee in the kitchen. It had been officially announced that Sam was coming to Buckland to do for Mr. Frodo and look after his bit of garden, an arrangement that was approved by the gaffer, though it did not console him for the prospect of having Lobelia as a neighbor. Our last meal at Bag End, said Frodo, pushing back his chair. They left the washing up for Lobelia, Pippin, and Sam strapped up their three packs and piled them in the porch. Pippin went out for a last stroll in the garden. Sam disappeared. The sun went down. Bag End seemed sad and gloomy and disheveled. Gloomy? Gloomy and disheveled. Frodo wandered round the familiar rooms and saw the light of the sunset fade on the walls and shadows creep out of the corners. It grew slowly dark indoors. He went out and walked down to the gate at the bottom of the path, and then, on a short way down the hill road, he half expected to see Gandalf come striding up through the dark. The sky was clear and the stars were growing bright. It's going to be a fine night, he said aloud. That's good for a beginning. I feel like walking. I can't bear any more hanging about. I'm going to start and Gandalf must follow me. He turned to go back, then stopped, for he heard voices just round the corner by the end of Bagshot Row. One voice was certainly the old gaffer's. The other was strange and somehow unpleasant. He could not make out what it said, but he heard the gaffer's answers, which were rather shrill. The old man seemed put out. Hello, Mr. Baggins has gone away, went this morning, and my Sam went with him. Anyway, all this stuff went. Yes, sold out and gone, I tell ye. Why? Why is none of my business nor yours? Where to? That ain't no secret. He's moved to Buckleberry or some such place. Away down yonder, yes it is, a tidy way. I never been so far myself. They're queer folks in Buckland. No, I can't give no message. Good night to you. Footsteps went away down the hill. Frodo wondered vaguely why the fact that they did not come up on the hill come on up the hill seemed a great relief. I am sick of questions and curiosity about my doings, I suppose, he thought. What an inquisitive lot they all are. He had half a mind to go and ask the gaffer who the inquirer was, but he thought better or worse of it, and turned and walked quickly back to Bag End. Pippin was sitting on the pack, on his pack in the porch. Sam was not there. Frodo stepped inside the dark door. Sam, he called. Sam, time. Coming, sir, came the answer from far within, followed soon by Sam himself, wiping his mouth. He had been saying farewell to the beer barrel in the cellar. All aboard, Sam, said Frodo. Yes, sir, I'll last for a bit now, sir. Frodo shut and locked the round door and gave the key to Sam. Run down with this to your home, Sam, he said. Then cut along the row and meet us as quick as you can at the gate in the lane beyond the meadows. We are not going through the village tonight. Too many ears prickling and, and eyes prying. I actually said pricking instead of prickling. Sorry about that. Um, Sam ran off at full speed. Well, now we're off at last, said Frodo. They shouldered their packs and took up their sticks and walked around the corner to the west side of Bag End. Goodbye, said Frodo, looking at the dark, blank windows. He waved his hand and then turned and, following Bilbo if he had known it, hurried after Peregrine down the garden path. They jumped over the low place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the fields, passing into the darkness like a rustle in the grasses. At the bottom of the hill on the western side they came to the gate opening on to the narrow lane. They were halted and adjusted the straps of their packs. Presently Sam appeared, trotting quickly and breathing hard. His heavy pack was hoisted high on his shoulders, and he had put on his head a tall, shapeless felt bag which he called a hat. In the gloom he looked very much like a dwarf. I am sure I... I am sure you have given me all the heaviest stuff, said Frodo. I pity snails and all that carry their homes on their backs. 
I could take a lot more yet, sir. My packet is quite light, said Sam, stoutly and untruthfully. No, you don't, Sam, said Pippin. It's no good for him. He's got nothing except what he ordered us to pack. He's been slack lately, and he'll feel the weight less when he's walked off some of his own. Be kind to a poor old hobbit, laughed Frodo. I shall be as thin as a willow wand, I'm sure, before I get to Buckland. But I was talking nonsense. I suspect you have taken more to your more than your share, Sam, and I shall look into it at our next packing. He picked up his stick again. Well, we all like walking in the dark, he said, so let's put some miles behind us before bed. For a short way, they followed the lane westward. Then, leaving it, they turned left and looked and took quietly to the fields again. They went in single file along hedgerows and the borders of coppices, and night fell dark about them. In their dark cloaks they were, all, they were as invisible as if they all had magic rings. Since they were all hobbits and were trying to be silent, they made no noise that even hobbits would hear. Even the wild things in the fields and woods hardly noticed their passing. After some time, they crossed the water west of Hobbiton by a narrow plank bridge. The stream was there, no more than a winding black ribbon bordered with leaner alder trees. A mile or two further south, they hastily crossed the great road from Brandywine Bridge. They were now in the Tookland, and bending southeastwards, they made for a green hill country. As they began to climb its first slopes, they looked back and saw the lamps in Hobbiton far off twinkling in the gentle valley of the water. Soon it disappeared in the folds of the darkened land, and was followed by bywater beside its grey pool. When the light of the last farm was far behind, peeping among the trees, Frodo turned and waved a hand in farewell. "'I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley again,' he said quietly. When they had walked for about three hours, they rested. The night was clear, cool, and starry, but smoke-like wisps of, sm of mist were creeping up the hillsides from the streams and deep meadows. Thin-clad birches, swaying in a light wind above their heads, made a black net against the pale sky. They ate a very frugal supper for hobbits, and then went on again. Soon they struck a narrow road that went rolling up and down, fading gray into the darkness ahead, the road to Woodhall and Stock and the Buckleberry Ferry. It, it climbed away from the main road in the water valley and wound over the skirts of the green hills toward Woody End, a wild corner of, east, of the East Farthing. After a while, they plunged into a deeply cloven track between tall trees that rustled their dry leaves in the night. It was very dark. At first they talked or hummed a tune softly together, being now far away from inquisitive ears. Then they marched on in silence, and Pippin began to lag behind. At last, as they began to climb a steep slope, he stopped and yawned. I am so sleepy, he said, that soon I shall fall down on the road. Are you going to sleep on your legs? It's nearly midnight. I thought you liked walking in the dark, said Frodo, but there is no great hurry. Mary expects us some time the day after tomorrow, but that leaves us nearly two days more. We'll halt at the first likely spot. The wind's in the west, said Sam. If we get to the other side of this hill, we shall find a spot that is sheltered and snug enough, sir. There is a dry fir wood just ahead, if I remember rightly. Sam knew the land well within twenty miles of Hobbiton, but that was the limit of his geography. Just over the top of the hill they came on the patch of fir wood. Leaving the road, they went into the deep resin-scented darkness of the trees and gathered dead sticks and cones to make a fire. Soon they had a merry crackle of flame at the foot of a large fir tree, and they sat round it for a while until they began to nod. Then each in an angle of the great tree's roots, they curled up in their cloaks and blankets and were soon fast asleep. 
They set no watch, even Frodo feared no danger yet, for they were still in the heart of the Shire. A few creatures came and looked at them when the fire had died away. A fox passing through the wood on business of his own stopped several minutes and sniffed. Hobbits, he thought. Well, what's next? I have heard of strange doings in this land, but I have seldom heard of a hobbit sleeping out of doors under a tree. Three of them. There's something mighty queer behind this. He was quite right but he never found out any more about it. I think that might just be a very well place to end. I think the next section is slightly longer than what we just read, but I think reading both of them together is going to be a little bit tenuous. So um, we are going to stop there and pick it up. JJ says, boo, boo. Mom said it. Oh, mom said it too. Um, so there we will end. Okay. And we will greet you again in the morrow. Made a monstrosity. Oh, and it also says take that. Excuse me. And thank you for watching. Thank you for um, um paying attention to the story that's one of my favorite books of all time um, so I hope that you're enjoying it as well this is my fourth time through it so I hope you're enjoying God bless have a good night and we'll see you tomorrow bye